Here on the line, I hope we have Professor Jordan Peterson. This is a professor from uh, University of Toronto who uh, came into the public eye for refusing to use all these uh, different pronouns he's told to use. And uh, I think it's indicative of a massive wave going on in academ academia where they are eating their own. I'm not talking about people rooting out racist, sexist, homophobes, etc. I'm talking about liberals versus liberals for the most part. We just had a guy in, in NYU who's been asked to leave for his anonymous tr Twitter account. We have a professor in Ottawa, uh, Janice Fiamenko, I believe. She's getting in trouble. And every time you look at these people and you go, all right, let me hear this Holocaust denier or something, you listen to what they're saying and it is benign. It could not be less radical. And it's a really a great mirror on how radical their uh, detractors have become. Uh, professor, are you there? I'm here. How are you, sir? I'm well. Um, have you noticed, by the way, that these these waves of professor purging tend to happen around Halloween? Is that a coincidence? Well, I hope it's just a coincidence, but you never know about something like that. I mean, it is when the monsters come out, after all. <laughs> yeah, last year there was uh, an email, I think it went around Missouri uh, State, where that said, hey, these are the costumes you can't wear. And then a woman who focused on early childhood education said, this is actually exactly how we're told to talk to infants. Mm -hmm. And that yeah, well, started an Yale avalanche. Too, right? Pardon me? Yeah, there was a big scandal at Yale last year where the uh, administration sent out recommendations for non-offensive costumes. And uh, one of the house masters uh, wrote an email to her students suggesting that it might be okay for them to wear whatever damn costume they wanted to wear. Right. And uh, she got just pilloried for that. She wrote a recent article describing her experiences that was just posted a couple of days ago. Yeah, it was awful. And, and she, the Yale administration. I think she quit after that. She did, yeah. Yeah, you keep seeing, the, like, there'll, there'll be a story, uh, oh, the, the Ku Klux Klan came through our campus, was yelling the N-word, dragging a noose, and uh, it's horrible what we go through. And you hear that story and you think, I don't really see the Klan going to universities. That's not really... And then, bef as we discover that's a hoax, we also learn the president steps down. And you think, what is with all this capitulation? It just fosters more outrage. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, it is rather hard to understand, you know, like one of the things I've really been struck by, um, among many other things over the last month is there's been virtual silence on the part of my faculty uh, colleagues, apart from the 200 or so who wrote a letter basically denouncing me, but they don't under, they don't really understand. So one of the things I've come to realize, for example, is that I think the social justice warriors are going to go after the evolutionary psychologists and biologists left next. I mean, they're after the scientists because their claim, for example, that there's no such thing as gender and that it's, 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 or even that there's no such thing as biological sex, which is what my opponent on TVO's The Agenda argued the other day, uh, Nicholas <laughs> Matt, who's a professor at the University of Toronto. I mean, we're, we're dangerously close to enshrining certain kinds of, I would say, erroneous pseudoscientific presuppositions right into our law. And uh, another thing that we haven't really talked about, you know, because I've been so focused on the gender identity part of Bill C-16 and its uh, equivalent legislation is the gender expression component. If you read the Ontario Human Rights Commission website carefully, what you'll find essentially is that there's no difference between the now protected gender expression and fashion choice. Because gender expression, while well, gender expression is just how you manifest your gender identity in clothing and dress, essentially. And there's no difference between that and fashion. And so I'm telling you, it looks very much like Ontario has already made fashion criticism into a hate crime. And I, <laughs> yeah, you know, it'd be, it'd be funny if it wasn't true. Well, but because it is true, it's not funny at all. It's quite awful. Well, they, they, I remember being a punk rocker in Ottawa in the 80s, and it was really hard to be accepted as the group. You had to have the right pants, the right gear. You had to like the exact right bands. Everything had to be perfectly consistent. And if you were one thing off, like you had crass on your leather jacket, well, they're vegetarian, so that's wrong. It seems so easy to become a woman that we've trivialized womanhood to the point where it's, it's less than punk. Or being yeah, well, a mod. Yeah, one of the one of the funny things that's happening about that is that there's actually a split developing on the left uh, between the, the the feminists and the and the gender bender types. Um, not the transsexuals per se, I wouldn't say, but but well, but them too. But more the ones that are doing this for trendy reasons is that uh, there are a variety of feminist women who aren't so happy that 
that being a woman has now been uh, basically deemed nothing more than a, a subjective choice. And so the, the Title IX advocates in the United States, for example, are starting to go to war with the equity people because they're they're both extreme and both on the left, but their their extremism is butting heads. So right. Well, it's like extremist uh, Muslims. They end up killing more Muslims than anyone else. Or you go to a Nazi skinhead music festival and there's going to be tons of fights breaking out just because that's their nature. They're a violent people. And these far lefties are so dogmatic and aggressive that you lock them in a room together and they're going to cannibalize each other. Yeah, well, they're a funny kind of aggressive, too, because they, they don't actually engage in physical fights because that would take individual against individual. They tend to gang up together in little mobs and then go after people yes. like that New York professor, which is, you know, that's that's what happened to him is absolutely appalling. And he so. and he again, he's a liberal. He uh, used an anonymous Twitter account. He never cited NYU once. I have no idea how they found out that it was him. But now he's been forced to step down. And all he did was say, I think these trigger warnings and safe spaces are ridiculous. And that is ultimately what's best for the students. I mean, we have law students now who are being told they don't have to attend rape law classes. Well, now yeah, you've made a worse lawyer. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, one of the things, one of my credos, by the way, is I like to terrify my students. <laughs> I'm dead serious about that, man. I think if they're not a little bit afraid of me, there is something absolutely wrong. Like the, the course I teach called Maps of Meaning, which is based on a book I wrote about 20 years ago. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to convince my students of is that if they would have been in, in Germany in the 1930s, the probability that they would have been Nazis instead of, you know, oppressed people uh, uh, rescuing heroes is almost 100 percent. Right. And I'll tell you, when you if you do enough psychological analysis to know that you could have been a guard in the Auschwitz camps, that's not exactly the sort of thing that makes you feel safe. And right. it shouldn't either, because human beings are, we have an unbelievable capacity for malevolence. And it oft, often disguises itself in, you know, s this kind of smug self-righteousness that characterizes these bloody neo-Marxists that, that have invaded the campuses and that are in the process of invading uh, the rest of the culture as fast as they can possibly manage it. I'm not their friends, not in the least. Right. And so, and the idea that we should be making students feel safe on campuses is ex absolutely absurd. You read someone like Nietzsche or Dostoevsky or Solzhenitsyn, those people will terrify, or Carl Jung for that matter, those people will terrify you right down to the bottom of your soul. That's how you can tell you're being educated. Yeah, you remind me it's of... absolutely appalling. Of Werner Herzog in that documentary about Timothy Treadwell, who was eaten by a bear that he thought he could make friends with, and Werner goes... Timothy sees nature as friendly and all forgiving. I, on the other hand, see it as highly cruel and irrational, and it will devour you at any opportunity. And then t guess who gets eaten by the bear? Not Werner, yeah. Timothy. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, to some degree, it depends on whether you're a follower of Rousseau or a follower of Hobbes. That's, that's right. one way to look at it, right? But the... Yeah, I mean, we're supposed to be toughening up students. We're supposed to be preparing them to take on difficult intellectual battles and to stand up forthrightly as citizens. And what's happening in the U.S. is this pandering to people who are pathologically not anxious so much, because I can understand that, but cowardly, because right. you can be anxious and brave, right? It just means that you are afraid, but you'll stand up and face things that you're frightened of. But you can be anxious and cowardly, which means you retreat and you want the whole world to 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 kowtow to your to your inability to deal with the the I would say the horrors of society and the terrors of nature, and you could add to that the the, the malevolence of the human soul. And if you get educated, you start to understand those sorts of things, and it's not pretty and it's not comfortable. Well, isn't this sort of an I almost think this is a good argument against capitalism and the free market because the client at these schools is these kids, these annoying millennials, and they want philosophy of self, how to be gay, all these ridiculous classes. And so the school goes, well, we don't want to burn a bridge here. Let's kowtow to the customer. Well, the I, customer's I always right. For, I feel bad for the millennials. They've been taught by these politically correct types ever since they were little. I mean, and this is really happening in Canada at, at an extraordinarily rapid rate. You have institutions like the Ontario Institute of the Stud for the Studies of Education, which is an absolutely appalling institution in my estimation. And, you know, they've, they've produced nonstop political activists in the guise of teachers who've been teaching this nonsense to young people, 
you know, right from elementary school forward. I mean, what the hell do we expect? And then in the United States, they've taken these these millennials and, you know, ratcheted up their tuition costs and and then forced them into a kind of indentured servitude. Yeah. And that's part of the reason that they're being that they're being kowtowed to, you know, because you can't declare bankruptcy on your student loans in the United States, say. Eh? So this, the young people are being enticed into mortgaging their future, just like indentured slaves were when they were, or indentured servants were when they were taken from Europe 200 years ago. Yeah, so, I owe my soul to the company store. That's right. That's right. You know, and so, and then the, the millennials, the, the anxious social justice warrior types who want protection, you know, they push and say, well, this frightens me. Maybe I should be protected. And the administration, the faculty goes, oh, yes, that really is scary. We really should protect you. And all it does is validate their their fear. And these people aren't very old and, you know, and 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 they, they need some guidance. That's what the hell university is for, that to protect, maintain and expand the culture instead of taking bloody axe swings at its roots, right. which is what's happening now. Well, if, if there's not good, if there's one thing, if I think the one thing society needs almost more than anything is entrepreneurs. That's what innovates. That's what pays your mortgage. That, that and that's a rare trait. Yeah. But if there's one thing an entrepreneur needs to have, that's the ability to fail. I I, I estimate you have twelve twelve failures for every success. We had balloons here on the show earlier. <laughs> uh, Twelve failures for every success. If you can't handle failure, you're doomed as an entrepreneur, and a society without entrepreneurs is doomed. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, the students are protected from failing, and, and I mean, there's incredible pressure. For example, um, and you see this. Another thing that's happening on the campuses is that uh, the the accessibility people are are raging completely out of control too. So we're enticing students continually on campus to claim disabilities that to claim impairment in their performance associated with disabilities at an ever expanding rate instead of just using objective criteria by which to judge people. And the problem is is see the problem with that is is that authority should be a uh, should mimic the real world so to speak. So if you're a parent, you should you should interact with your children in approximately the same manner that the harsh social world and nature is going to interact with them. So what you do is you discipline your children when they're doing things that are going to hurt them if they do them in the real world. Right. And you should be doing that with students too. It says the standards should be there as an, an, an analog of the standards that are going to confront them in their marriages and their friendships and their business relationships and all of that. And, and all of those genuine institutions and situations have unbelievably harsh standards. They just flatten you if you make a mistake. And protecting students from that in university is, is well, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of Oedipal coddling. And really what I do see happening in our society is the rise of the, of the Oedipal mother from a Freudian perspective. And the Oedipal mother is the mother who just won't distance herself enough from her children and wants to protect them against everything. And what she ends up doing is hollowing out their soul and, <laughs> and transforming them into permanent infants. It is not a good thing. Well, it's, it's a form of child abuse in many ways. And that's the irony of this situation is that you have the student's best interests in mind, whereas the administration just has the student's tuitions in mind. And one of them is abusing children and the other is trying to rescue them. Well, I can tell you that, you know, I've been teaching this Maps of Meaning course for it's almost 30 years. I taught it at Harvard for six years and then I've taught it at the University of Toronto ever since. And I would say that uh, I've got a lot of student comments over the decades from that, and this has been an unbelievably popular course. And I would say 90% of the students who've taken my Maps of Meaning course say that it changed their life. I'm, and I mean that dead seriously. I'm taking people and toughen them up, toughening them up and teaching them how to speak properly and to write properly and to be, to be uh, what I'm trying to inoculate them against ideological possession. And it works too. And so I have students writing me all the time, my past students too, and people on the net now, because about a million and a half people have watched my educational videos who've told me that the material that I'm presenting with them is straightening out their psyches and improving their sanity and, and um, making them you know, de decent, honest, tough people. And that's bloody well what university should do. And it's failing. In fact, I think the universities, I really do believe now that the universities do more harm than good. Yeah. You come and out and dumber I'm, than when I'm you so went in, to say up that. to your ass in debt. Well, yeah. I, I see you as a canary in a coal mine, and if anything happens to you, it doesn't bode well for the rest of society. Yeah, well, so far I seem to be doing pretty well with this battle. 
We'll see what the, the universities decided to host a debate, although I, I don't know if they found anybody to debate me. I told them I'd do both sides of the damn debate if they can't find anyone. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show, and uh, I'd love to have you back again. Hey, no problem. Good to talk to you. Cheers, Professor. Hey, bye. Bye.